accompanying text. We've been spending the last couple of weeks working through 1 John. This time we're going to go to the Gospel of John, uh, another extended and expanded reflection by the Apostle John on what it means to be connected to God in a way that manifests this connection in very concrete ways. And I just want to, you know, certainly acknowledge um, the importance of us continuing to keep in prayer and in support all of the young people across the country that are uh, continuing to act with principled and moral resistance and critique related to the uh, genocide that's happening over in Gaza. Certainly, uh, their uh, very principled moral protest are uh, unfortunately being criminalized by folk that I think should know better. And, um, and so I hope that all of us, I, I, I came to this realization, and, and I, I'll take this five minutes out of my sermon, so I'll, we'll still get out on, at the same time. So I say amen. But I, 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 I began to have this, this, this thought that it seems like uh, the mainstream American uh, United States of America citizenry is um, we seem to be reaching a uh, fatigue around protests. Um, and it's very interesting uh, because I know that protests are always uh, for those who are not participating in it. They seem like, oh, y'all, these people, they just doing so much. And they, you know, you sh if you're in a protest and you're shutting down the freeway and you may be caught in it, you just like frustrated or you're on a bridge or if you're, you're on, the, on the barred and, and if you're blocking roadways and, you know, and you don't, you just, you just frustrated. Like, oh man, why, why these, why these, why don't we just go, go somewhere? But I hope folks appreciate that if it weren't for protests by people who had principled moral critiques against oppression in this country, uh, many of us would still be struggling just for the measure of human and civil rights that we have. Uh, it is indeed the case that, um, you know, the goodwill of the powerful seem to always be particularly short when it comes to expanding what is basic human decency to those that don't have power. And uh, certainly the college students all across the country who are uh, weighing in on their university's billion dollar investments, funding certain kinds of military and other uh, contractors over in Gaza, but also, or in Israel, but also, you know, these things are happening uh, in some of our other uh, struggling, uh, underdeveloped, or uh, poverty-stricken countries across the world as well. And so I, I want to just invite us to not grow weary in well-doing, as the scripture says. Uh, I do believe that principled moral protest is God's work. And it ought not be criminalized. We ought not, um, even if it's uncomfortable for some of us who aren't engaged in the protest, uh, that is what a protest is supposed to do. It's supposed to make us all uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, I was reading a report that said 99% of the protests happening at the campuses across the country have been peaceful, which just is to say, some of you may see my post that uh, acts of violence physical violence, property violence, if you want to call it that, have, have been historically non-existent at a protest of this size and magnitude. And so there's no reason for police officers and riot gear and guns being unleashed on our, our, our teenagers and young adults. Uh, it's just no reason for it. And so I hope that um, we all remain prayerful this week, I'm actually traveling to South Africa. I leave tonight uh, to head to a conference in Johannesburg with some of the former organizers of the uh, 
efforts that ended the South African apartheid. And we're taking a group of clergy and activists to participate in a, a conference this week. And so uh, folks from all across the world are gonna be there. It'll be several hundred of us. And a lot of them are Christians and followers of Jesus and Muslims and uh, agnostics. And you know, it's not something that I'm finding to be particularly limited to any group of folks. I think if you love peace and justice, we ought to look at the state of the world and realize that it's up to all of us to get ourselves back, maybe not back, get ourselves continuing. As Dr. King says, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. How I many you know that bending happens when all of us get on that edge, that straight and jump on it until it starts to bend in the right direction. And so pray for us as we travel. But more than that, you know, all of us who are local, if you ever have any opportunity go up to the Cal, Cal campus or to any campuses that are close to you and go to the protest and just offer a word of encouragement to the young people. Take a little food or a little money or be a blessing to them, amen? Because they are going to be narrated through history as freedom fighters. And wouldn't it be just terrible for your grandkids to look at your social media page and you just like the bull Connor of this generation, amen? It's just like always mad about the protest. And you know, those folk uh, who was mad about the protest during the civil rights movement, history don't, don't, don't feel like they were on the right side. <laughs> Hello, somebody. So let's be on the right side, amen? And let's keep encouraging our, our young people and those who, who are committed to the protest to uh, act with moral courage. We certainly believe and hope that nonviolence carries the day. And uh, certainly I pray that everyone stays very protected and safe, although I know in some of these protests you do have provocateurs and people who are planted in the protest to turn it into something that uh, betrays the spirit of the protest. And so when that happens, we ought to still hold in our mind the demands, the moral demands of the actual protest itself and uh, not get swept into the propaganda, amen? All right, John chapter number 15, we'll you know, continue to refer to some of this, I think, in the sermon, in the message, but uh, I, I realize that for many of us, our lives are uh, on a day-to-day -day basis continuously in need of God's uh, intervention. Amen. We constantly try to figure out, God, are you still active in that work? And, and, uh, and I do believe that God is here with us, and God is causing us to, to be impacted by God's loving presence. John chapter 15, verse number 9. This is the Apostle John. This is John, uh, probably one of the youngest disciples. It's thought to have been that he started following Jesus when he was maybe a teenager, 16, 17 years old. He was a, one of the youngest of all of these individuals who followed Jesus. And so John had a very personal relationship, a close relationship with Jesus, it appears. It's often believed that uh, he describes himself as being beloved. He was the most beloved disciple. Anybody ever met some kids just swear up and down that their parents love them more than they love you? Amen. This was like you did somebody's favorite. And, you know, your parents, you know, don't often want to admit if they are, if they're not. But, you know, people's self-description, John felt like he was one of Jesus' favorites of the twelve. And so you find throughout the account of John that John is giving a very powerful and important account of the mastery of Jesus over nature. You find uh, some very unique stories of Jesus' healings and, 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 and supernatural activities. One of the more powerful descriptions of Jesus in the book of John that is a little unique are these sayings that are called the I am sayings. And so throughout the book of John, you'll see that uh, John describes Jesus, makes this introduction of Jesus using the very uh, sacred but distinctive description uh, of I am. If you're a Bible student, you will recall that in the book of Exodus, uh, when God makes God's introduction to Moses and Moses is trying to figure out who God is, God says to Moses, I am that I am. Anybody ever familiar with that, heard that before? I am that I am, which is just to say that uh, I will be whoever I need to be. And your mind can't comprehend the magnanimity of who I am. So I'm just saying that I am. Mm -hmm. 
Man, I can preach all by itself. I can just go home and just give give y'all the benediction. Amen. Because that God is saying to you today that I will be whoever I need to be in your life. If you need a healer, I am your healer. If you need a mind regulator, I am your mind regulator. If you need a way out of no way, God says, I am your way out of no way. If you need some help, God says, I am your help. Amen. If you need some correction, God says, I am. <laughs> you know, I don't want that. I don't want that God. I am. Amen. Just let, leave me alone, God. Somebody say amen. But how many of you got to take the good with the bad? The ugly with the beautiful and the happy with the sad. And you got to take it all together because it all adds up to a holistic expression and experience with God. In the interest of time, because we have to take communion in a few minutes, I'm not going to go uh, all the way up through the first part of John 15, but one of the particular uh, important I am sayings of Jesus in the first part of this passage is Jesus describing himself to the disciples, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. I'm the branches. And uh, you are connected to me. And apart from me, you can do nothing. This is Jesus kind of words his disciples in verses 1 through 8. And so we're picking up in verse number 9. Uh, if this is a continuous uh, theme that we've been preaching about on love, relearning love, this particular passage is uh, going to give us an opportunity to think a little bit about how to hold on to your love. Right. In a world of haters and hate and amen. How do you hold on to your love? Right. John chapter 15, verse nine. As the father has loved me, Jesus says, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And I want you to think about this for a second. That. Jesus seems to suggest to us that one of the ways we can abide in the love of God is to be faithful to what God commands us to do. Now, it is quite a rudimentary point, if you will, like, why should Christians have to be reminded to obey God's commands? You would think, hey, you know, I follow Jesus. Of course, I'm going to obey God's commands. But how many of you can be honest and say that your spirit be willing? But this whole flesh is quite a piece of work. And so there seems to be this correlation Jesus is making to Abiding in love as a result of keeping God's commands. And as we keep reading, verse number 11 says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. It's some, some very, again, another interesting suggestion by Jesus. That if you abide in the love of God by keeping the commandments of God, your love will remain full. And... You will find joy when you follow the ways of God. Now, there is a necessary part of our Christian theological tradition that rightly focuses on heaven, i.e. eternal existence and fellowship with God. Right? We believe that there is life after death and that life after death will have us in eternal fellowship with God. But some people preach eternal fellowship with God to be the payoff for following Jesus. 
Now, that is quite a payoff. Like, when I die, I get to be in, like, pleasure and heaven forevermore. But could you also imagine that there is a correlation to your life on earth, the quality of your life, the how many are always looking for some more love? I never met anybody be like, oh, I'm tired of love. I don't want no more love. No hate. I just want hate. Just, just give me more. Give me more. I mean, Kobe kind of was like that when he was in those, you know, arenas and, you know, just knocking everybody's team out. And he would just be like, yes. He, remember that commercial? He's standing there and they booing him. He just... Most people want love. Most people want joy. Could it be, beloved, that one of our most important realizations as we follow Jesus is that love and joy can be found in abundance when you follow God's commands? Now, it's very hard in a world full of haters full of violent folks and full of dead, death-dealing folks to figure out how can I find love and joy in the midst of despair and hopelessness. I mean, it can feel that way sometimes, right? Pastor, I mean, I'd be appreciative what you'd be saying, but as soon as I leave church, I'm going back home to hell. My neighborhood is hell. My family's hell. The news is hell. And you hear talking about love and joy and abundance. It ain't at home. Well, let's keep reading. Verse number 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Coming again, still in Easter liturgical celebration. We will spend time doing communion in a few moments. No one has a greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus says to them, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, I do not call you servants. I do not call you slaves. I do not call you people who just work for me any longer because the servant, listen, does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Some of the best scriptures written down in the text. Listen to this. You did not choose me, Jesus says, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to speak from the topic for just a few more moments. Uh, holding on to the love. God bless the word that has been read for us. Your people hide this word in our hearts so we won't sin against you and send the anointing that makes preaching easy. May it rest on me and all the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Hello, look at your neighbor. Tell them, hold on to the love. Amen. Now, we will be celebrating the Eucharist uh, communion celebration in a few moments. We do this at the way uh, as a kind of practice, as a ordinance, if you will, uh, in the kind of history of the church. It's called the sacrament, the sacramental practice of observing the body and the blood of Jesus, this idea Right, that Jesus loved us so much that he gave his own life as an expression of ultimate commitment to God's commands. Right, and that the empire killed Jesus because Jesus was so disruptive to the structure and status quo of certain kinds of leaders. And I want you to know, beloved, that 
This practice of communion has been an act of not only solidarity with the life and the ministry and the struggle of Jesus, literally for thousands of years since the first communion given by Jesus days before his, his, his execution, if you will. Christians have been gathering on the first day of the week all across the world. Last week was the Ethiopian, I believe, Coptic or Orthodox Church celebrated Easter. This past week, the Russian and Greek Orthodox Church are celebrating Easter. There are expressions of Christian discipleship all across the world beyond just the way, beyond just the American church. People are literally leaning into this act of Worship and solidarity. When they take communion, many of them take communion every week. They do so as a the theological term, means of grace that they believe, we believe, that when I take the body, when I drink the wine uh, through the blood, or vis-a-vis uh, -vis the blood, when I inhale or in, uh, 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 ingest these elements, they translate, they they, they dissolve into my body and spirit grace. Now, if you was in a, a part of an old school holiness Pentecostal church, sometimes you would go into church and you see a wheelchair on the wall. Y'all don't like a wheelchair on the wall. You see a cane on the wall. You see crutches on the wall. And the old school church that believed in the healing of the body and the soul would have these artifacts on the wall because there'd be people in the church who came in a church on a wheelchair and walked out on their own two feet. Who came in living on some crutches and just walked on out on their own. Who came in strung out on drugs or substances and left under the power of the spirit free from the limiting bondage of whatever ailed them. This idea that this solidarity, this proximal association with God through Christ in the Holy Spirit has the ability to heal your body, to infuse within you power you don't have right now. It's often lost on many of us in the American context because we just don't believe that the supernatural is really accessible to us in that way. So a lot of us, we just participate in things as a ritual. But I want you to know, you have a pastor who believes that God can touch you or turn you all the way around in a moment. <laughs> you got a pastor, you're part of a church that believes that if you need some more love, you can come in here without love and you can get more love. If you need some joy, if you need some peace, if you need a mind-transforming experience, Engaging in acts like the Eucharist or baptism or praise and worship or the fellowship or prayer or study. All of these things are still at work among us. And how many of you know if my expectation is small, I will get little. But if my expectation is huge, how many know God says that I can do exceedingly and abundantly? above all you can ask or think. It is in this way that I appreciate this idea where Jesus tells the disciples, abide in me. Just like I abide in my father. And if you abide in me, then there will be some things that I will ensure are released into your life. Now, for many of us, this transactional description of association with God leads us to always ask for material things because we are a material-driven people. You know, whenever we feel like we need something from God, we usually ask God for some more money or some more honey, some booze or some houses, some cars. But I do believe that there's something powerful about when God gives you the kind of blessing that money can buy. Abide in 
Christ. Is the first point that I want to briefly describe to you as key to holding on to love, because if love comes from God, then our ability to abide in Christ allows us to then abide in the love that comprises God's existence. I, 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 I uh, took the kids. We took the kids. We usually go up to uh, Yosemite every year with some of our friends. These are outdoor people. I'm not an outdoor person. I grew up in the Bayview Hunters Point, part of San Francisco. Uh, we didn't even go to go to Gay Park all that much. Somebody say, man, it's like, you know, we maybe go to, I don't know, Portola, West Point, <laughs> Jolie Gym, Kiska Road. That's about as outdoors as we got. We went to Yosemite and we walking through the park and you run into these trees. Trees that are so huge that you literally can walk through a burnt out or dug out bottom of a tree. And I thought I'd put the picture up here because me and my girls and Sharice, we all were standing inside this tree as part of our evidence of a family trip. Because, <laughs> you know, your kids, when you get older, they don't want to take no pictures with their with they parents. <laughs> So, like, no, we are yours and you are ours, and we we going to have evidence that at the age of 14, we were together. At the age of we, we coexisted. Somebody say amen. I'm glad nobody else has these problems with teenagers. Amen. It's just, it's just us. But there was a fascinating, as I looked at the picture, when I thought of abiding in Christ, I thought of a hollowed tree that is so huge that you can fit inside it and there still be room for other people. That the love of God is so broad that it is not intended to fit you like a tailor-made suit. It is so broad that you can abide in it and by abiding in the tree, Everything that the tree offers is extended to you. It started to rain, and we standing inside the tree. Guess what the tree extended to us without our request? Shelter. We were dry. Why, everything else outside of the tree was getting wet. Abiding in the tree didn't cause the rain to stop falling. He just made sure that as long as we stayed inside this hollow trunk, we could stay dry. Well, I want to express to you, beloved, that there's something powerful about this idea of us setting up our lives inside the love of God. First point I'll lift up then is what does it mean for you and I to occupy love? To live inside love. Verse 7 says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. Abiding in the love of God means, beloved, that you and I have an invitation to walk through the course of your life Living inside the love of God. Living inside the love of God does not negate all of your external circumstances. But it does give you the ability to have the benefits of what God's love can provide. Are you following me this morning? That there is a powerful benefit in being inside the love of God in an active way. I want to believe that God's love passively holds the universe together. That God's just not hating everybody else and just loving you. No, that's some dysfunctional colonizing theology. 
God loves the world. Believe that. But how many know there's sometimes some active participation that you can do that will create a benefit for you that you could only get if you actively engaged in it? There are lessons. There are there are practices. There are things that we can do that literally allow us to be able to draw down the benefit of being inside the love of God. I believe in this moment that solidarity with the suffering among us in your family, in the community, in the neighborhood is one way that we actively abide in the love of God. That when I decide to actively abide in God's love by being close to those whom God loves the most, maybe not the most, but especially you are actively abiding in God's love. And this is why I love uh, James Cone. He says that any theology that does not speak to the theme of liberation, the theme of freedom, is not Christian theology. Right? That there is an active participation with Christ in the suffering of the oppressed. That is an extension of his love. And when you and I are conscious of that, we can build our lives. We can build our existence. We can literally occupy love. Why is this important? Because I do believe that as we go through the rest of this transitional era, that likely will characterize many of our lives. If we do not make a decision to occupy love and make sure love occupies us, we will not have the benefits, the grace, the strength needed to endure seasons of difficulty, listen, without becoming the difficulty itself. When I say I want you and I to abide in love, I'm just saying I want you and I to be people who are so inside God's love that even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of transition, even in the midst of pain, I can still be love. I will not become a monster because I'm in monstrous territory. Because I'm abiding in love. Do you understand what I mean? Abiding in love does not take pain away. It gives you strength to not become that which you are rightly trying to resist. Why? Because I have a different location. My location perpetually through my practices is that I will abide in love. And guess what? Solidarity with the oppressed, with the struggling, listen to this, is an expression of your love capacity. <laughs> Solidarity with the oppressed, with the suffering in your family, on your block. Solidarity with those who are incarcerated. Solidarity with Pookie and them. Solidarity with your family members you don't like that much is an expression of your love capacity. Some of us, Lord help me to be gentle today. Some of us have such limited capacity. Go back to that image of the tree. Where when you try to stand up underneath that tree, it don't cover all of you. Because your capacity is limited. So your arm can fit in there, but the rest of your body getting wet. Because your capacity for love has shrunk. But guess what? You don't have to stay that small. In your capacity, the Holy Spirit knows how to stretch us to increase our capacity 
to love. Now, if you remember last week, we said love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Love is a long description of things that many of us, if we were keeping it real, we would say, my, my, my. I want to love, but I'm not a person with a lot of love capacity. The response is not just be like, well, I'm just going to love you the way I know how. No, the answer is, God, give me more capacity to love. And my question then for you today, do you occupy love and does love occupy you? My question is, what struggles expose the limitations of your solidarity, meaning your love capacity? And listen, it's the last thing, uh, then I'm just going to try to wind down here real quick. How do you abide in love and not get swallowed up by your problems? Now, I want to just say in the context of all of us who've had to go through hellish seasons of difficulty, it has not been a small thing to have to love people who've hurt us, to have to keep trying to show up for folk who, whenever you see them, a physical reaction. Anybody got some folk like that in your life? Like, I, I, I'm trying to do, Lord knows I'm trying to, I'm trying. But when I see them, I start sweating. I remember after I got beat up by the cops, I had to start going to these meetings. I got beat up by the cops March 1999. So I didn't, you know, do much with the police, you know, until I started to, you know, come home from seminary and started to start working in the community. And I remember the first time, I sat in a room full of cops. I think it was maybe 2011. And I was sitting in this room, and I just started sweating. And I'm like, man, what am I sweating for? I, I, I'm not doing nothing illegal. <laughs> I'm just sitting here in this chair. And there's a great book that says that your body keeps the score. Anybody ever heard of that book or heard of this idea that you often have unconscious trauma, pain that your body likely, if not addressed through therapy and mental health awareness month, this month we're going to do a little focus on that, I think the last Sunday of this month. So just a little something for free, praise God, while we're ready to take communion. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Is that trauma can stay in your body if you don't address it and it will manifest without you even giving it an invitation. So when I'm asking or suggesting we got to abide in love, what I'm saying, beloved, is that abiding in love is an alternative to you being swallowed up by despair. It is a way for you and I to not become people who are so spiritual in the application of the words of Jesus that we ignore the right and real challenges we face, right? The struggle for justice is a real challenge. The struggle to reconcile with your children or your partner or your family or the neighborhood, it's a real challenge. The struggle to make it home from jail and prison and find a job and get back on your feet, it's a real challenge. So, 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 so you, you and I, we got real challenges in the world. But there is a, suggestion that Jesus is making to us that if you abide in my love, the active love, you will have uh, the, 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 this, this, this last point. What, 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 what? You will have this ability to bear fruit that lasts. God says, you didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. While I am in my real world challenges, if I abide in the love of God, even in my struggle, I can produce fruit that outlasts my struggle. Being swallowed up in your struggle means that you will not escape your struggle intact. But I believe that we're being invited to think about how can I abide in love and produce fruit 
that last. Again, theologically, biblically, if you are been in the church a while, you read your Bible a few times. Ephesians chapter number five describes the fruit of the spirit as this love. Right, peace, love. Everybody say love. love. Fruit of the spirit, joy, peace, forbearance. Y'all know what forbearance means, right? That means that means you 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 got a, a, a long ability to bear with people. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me translate it for you. You ever said you getting on my last nerve? Have ever told that to somebody you love? Maybe somebody you don't love. Maybe you said it today on the way to church. You getting on my last nerve. Fruit of the Spirit means that your last nerve is long. <laughs> well, let me say it like this. It's longer than it was yesterday. That should make you feel better. Even your neighbor high five and tell him my last nerve is longer than it was yesterday. But you you pushing me today, though, now. I want you to understand. I said, my kids, you pushing me. I used to work with these knuckleheads. They're like, yo, man. You 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 making a believer out of me with what I believe. I want you to understand. <laughs> I really I be I be want to believe this thing, and you making me into a believer in a way I did not know was possible. Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. That's the fruit of the spirit. So if I were just to make this association and then we're going to pray. That when I abide in the love of God, when I'm able to grow my love capacity, my, my ability to be in solidarity with those who are suffering in my own life, myself perhaps even at times. Because I mean, sometimes you got to show the fruit of the spirit to yourself. It's not always an external facing thing. Sometimes you got to show love to yourself. Peace to you got to you got to have a last a long last nerve for yourself. Can I talk to some real folk in here for about 30 seconds? About all the many times you said you weren't going back there. You weren't going to do that again. Lord, I'm glad you brought me out of that cuz I'm never going back. <laughs> I wish I could talk to you in here today. And then you get back up in that mess. Whatever the mess was, you said you weren't going to fight at work no more, and here you are, you know, on a leave. <laughs> you said you weren't going to be caught drinking and driving, here you are on the side of the road with, with the police trying to walk that narrow walk. Said you weren't going to, you know, buy that thing you can't afford. Now you're trying to figure out how to rob Peter to pay Paul because them red bottoms or them Jordans or whatever, whatever it was, and you pray, God, if you just give me a blessing. I promise you, God, I won't be here no more. And then when we end up back in a mess, how many feel more guilty about it? Sometimes you guys got to be what? Gentle with yourself. Because you're not surprising God. I want you to know that. God's not, oh, McBride. I had such high hopes for you, man. <laughs> I know there is a presentation of God. Of God is like, oh, you know, chubby white man with a long beard and a stick. Bolts of lightning waiting for you to just do something. So you just, king. But if that were true, how many of us know none of us would survive? <laughs> I wouldn't survive. I'd be laid out. I'd be dead, I don't know, a million times over in the course of my life. God is not surprised by your foibles. But God is saying, if you abide in my love, your joy will be complete. You will bear fruit because you've been chosen to be in this appointment. And I want you to know, beloved, that there is a powerful, powerful opportunity for you and I, as followers of Jesus, 
in a very tumultuous season to decide, I will abide in the love of God. Abiding the love does not change my external circumstances necessarily, but it does cause me to produce fruit that will outlast my external circumstance. Fruit, good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. I may be in a hellish circumstance, but abiding the love allows me to still produce love inside my hellish condition, to access joy inside my hellish condition, to find peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, forbearance inside this condition. And beloved, that's what it means to abide in love. And the great thing about this is there's no judgment. It's just opportunity. God, where I'm sure it helped grow my love capacity. I only have enough love for this. God, help me by the end of this week to have love for that. When I take communion, God, let the supernatural sacramental impact of this practice as it's done for a millennia. May it give me more grace. When I come to the altar to pray and the tears are streaming down my eyes, may it increase my capacity for love. When I'm reading your word, when I'm fasting, when I'm singing, when I'm praying, when I'm protesting, when I'm loving on my children, when I'm at work, God, let your spirit expand my capacity to love. Because God, no matter what situation I'm in, I want to abide in your love. Come on, let's stand. Let's pray. And ask God. To allow this love that has been extended to us. Jesus says, I love you because the Father has loved me, so abide in my love. So my response to Jesus is, Jesus, I love you because you first loved me. So Jesus, may I abide in your love. Come on, just repeat that after me. Say, Jesus, I love you because you first loved me. So help me abide in your love. Say it again. Jesus, I love you because you first loved me. So help me to abide in your love. Me, God, I pray for the hand I'm holding today. I pray love, the kind of love that expands our capacity to love will be, God, infused in my neighbor today. God, may this love first penetrate the hardness of their own heart, their own experience. Some have been told they are not lovable in this way. So, God, I defeat that thought in their mind today, in their experience. God, no matter what circumstance, whether it's depression, whether it's self-harm oh god whether it's addiction whether it's low self-esteem isolation whether it's the, the 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 sickness in the mind the body the spirit whatever the ailment is god we say thank you that you love us you loved us first hallelujah and your love has been unconditional so god may love envelop my neighbor right now just squeeze their hand gently. God, may love just, just, just strike through them like a bolt of lightning or like a warmth. Lord God, that reminds them that they are alive in you. And you are alive and at work with them. God, may they abide in your love just like that oak tree in Yosemite, God, that we could stand underneath and we can sit under the shadow of the Almighty and find refuge and protection. God, I pray that they will find refuge in your love. And I pray it'll happen today. I pray it'll happen right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Now lift your hands where you're standing, God. It's me and I stand in the need of prayer. May this love visit my body. 
May this love well up in my heart and in my spirit. May the fruit of the spirit be manifest in my own life first. So God, there can be a reality of me abiding in you. Hallelujah. Heal the hurt in my heart. That's been a result of bad love. Poor love. Insufficient love. Heal me, God. Increase my capacity to love those you've placed in my life. And God, make joy complete in me that I could bear much fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands, everybody, and just say, I will abide in the love of the Lord.